my story begins in a rather unlikely place. It begins in the hot summer of Nashville, Tennessee in 1953 when I was 10 years old. My mother had been struggling all summer to find things for the kids to do. We'd been to vacation Bible school six times, <laughs> and we were all thoroughly ecumenical by that time. That was June and July, but then came the hot August, the horrible hot August. So she picked up one day and she said, boys and girls, my sister and I, get in the Pontiac. We're headed off 100 miles to the east to Salina, Tennessee, where uh, my brother and Uncle Ed works. We took off, we drove through the old Tennessee countryside on the old roads up into the hills. Pretty soon we were there in front of this giant TVA dam that had just been built. And my Uncle Ed was the chief engineer. I'd known him all my life. He'd spanked me when I was three years old for running out into the street, and I was still a little cross with him about that. <laughs> well... This day, he chose to treat me, 10 years old, like an adult. And he took me all over. He toured that dam from one end to the other. He was putting in the power station, the turbines, the generator, the power control area, and where the lines ran off to tie into the grid. And he took me up the hill by those lines. And he said, Danny, do you know that this dam here will power 45,000 Tennessee homes. Boy, that really wowed me. That got me excited. Mom had always said I was a lot like Uncle Ed, and I thought more of myself. Anyway, I went on and I went to a Vanderbilt engineering school. I had some of the same professors he had. My sophomore year, uh, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the coach gathered us all together, and he said, fellas, we're not going to have practice today. There may be no tomorrow. Go home, call your parents, and make a plan, you know. So we did. March came around, May, and President Kennedy, still, we were still around, got through it somehow. President Kennedy came to speak right out there where I kicked off on the football field, he stood right there and talked and gave us a very hopeful speech after scaring us to death. <laughs> and then I went back over to the Pike A house and sat up on the porch with my brothers as the motorcade came rolling by. The president waved at us. We waved at him. I got the feeling at that time that maybe the president would prefer to be up on the porch with us. But I know we would all prefer to be in that car. It was in that same seat that he sat less than six months later that he was murdered. Lots of things were going on when I was living a long time ago. I graduated Vietnam War, off and running. They had the draft, so I took a scholarship and figured this thing can't last for long. I'll take a two-year master's program in city planning. And I did. And after that, it was worse. The war was worse. It was... So I joined the Air Force, and I went to officer's training school down in San Antonio. And when I came out, I was assigned, because of engineering and planning, and a guy named McNamara, they were looking all over for people. There were only three people in the whole Air Force that had those two degrees. So they took me and gave me a, a position as a colonel. I was a second lieutenant, didn't know what I was doing and gave me a $180 million military construction program. <laughs> and when I was driving up there from San Antonio to Washington, I was thinking, goodness gracious, I've never spent $180 in one year, in, my, <laughs> in one month in my life. And I said, this is Washington, you know. <laughs> well, on the way up, I heard on the radio that Martin Luther King had been killed in Memphis. I said, my good God. When I arrived, this is the scene I saw. The town was burning, smoke everywhere. It was quite a shock. While I was there, uh, 
we had riots all the time. We had marches against the war. We had every four or five months, we had people come, as many as a million people come to fight the war. The war was ridiculous. We had tear gas in the air. We had tanks parked around, helicopters landing on the mall. These were rough times. But there was a great thing about it because there were a lot of people just like me that had been brought into Washington as officers. None of them wanted to be there, and we got to talking. We became great friends, friends for life. We were going to do something great. We didn't know what it was going to be, but we were locked down for four years to talk about it. <laughs> so we, we did, and we came up with plans. We actually theorized way ahead of the government about terrorism, but we thought it would be nuclear blackmail or something like that. But we were thinking about civil rights, and we were thinking about air pollution, water pollution, things like that. We were going to do something. We didn't know what, but we were going to do something. After my four years, I got in the car, went home to Nashville. Several years later, two of the guys, John Topping, an old Air Force buddy, and Joe Cannon had been running air and radiation for EPA. And they'd learned a lot about the atmosphere. And they were, they were scared. So they called me on the phone and said, Dan, I think we got that thing we've been looking for to do where we can work and do something worthwhile, put something back, find a solution, and make a big difference. And I said, what in the world is that? And they said, the climate. They said, we are taking mankind and taking carbon out of the atmosphere. We're burning it as fossil fuel, and we're putting it into the atmosphere, I mean, out of the ground, and putting it in the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And we're, the numbers, are, the curve is going right up like that. And we might be about to fry ourselves. I said, we don't know. Nobody's done the studies. Nobody's even looking at it. This was 1986. And we're going to start an organization, the first ever anywhere in the world, to try to protect America, protect the whole world, really, from climate change. And we decided to call it the Climate Institute. They said, uh, why don't you come on up? Six months later, we pulled... 250 people in from related disciplines at the National Labs, Department of Defense, NOAA, places like that, who knew about groundwater and things related to climate, but nobody was really looking at climate, you know. Pulled them in the Mayflower Hotel. We call it the first North American climate conference. Uh, John Chafee was there, the senator from Rhode Island. He was on to it. Roger Revelle was there. San Antonio. And just so happened that we had six Russian scientists just wandered in. They were in town visiting. They heard about us, and they came in. They went to almost every session. They spoke better English than a lot of people there. They were terrific. When we got ready for the final speech, all of us were aware that Gorbachev and Reagan were going to speak in about five or six weeks. And so... Chafee stood up, Senator Chafee, and he looked out at the table with the Russians, and he said, I got an idea, fellas. He said, why don't you go home and talk to your people, and I and these people here will go talk to our people and see if we can't get on the uh, plan for the summit. Well, their people talked to their people, our people talked to our people, and Reagan and Gorbachev got to talking about this thing. These were the two superpowers at the time. And they signed a communique on, on said, we need to look at this. This is serious. So we held another conference six months later, and we had 21 nations showed up. And we started looking at all these issues. We didn't know where we were going, but trying to get people interested. We didn't even know if we had a problem. And pretty soon... I was over in Geneva with 2,500 scientists from all over the world looking at every aspect of this climate issue. We continued to press. We did nation studies at 21 different nations around the world, tuned to what's going to happen to you in the Maldives, or what's going to happen to you in Syria, or what's going to happen to you in India as a result of this impending warming if it does occur. We always ask the question, what do we know, what do we don't know, and what do we need to find out? Those three questions. 
we had a bunch of other things that we did. I went to China, and I had the chance to talk to the Chinese Academy of Science for three days. But anyway, there I was, and um, we had a, after it was all over, we had no information above the Himalayan mountains to plug into our climate models. None of it. That's a huge hole, a huge cap when you're trying to look at all the weather patterns on the globe and try to figure out what's going on. So they sent six Chinese scientists to work with us and then to go back and to get the information that we needed to plug into it at that point. We did a lot of other things. We studied migration that was being driven by the sub-Saharan region shrinking every year by you could see it with the satellite images every year. It went further and further south. The Gobi went closer and closer and closer to Beijing. The Chinese told me, this is bad. We only have 400 miles between the Himalayan mountains and the Gobi Desert to be 1.3 billion people. And it's shrinking every day, and groundwater is going down and diving, and they were worried about these things. So they were on board. They, they abandoned their five-year plan to burn soft coal. And they started looking at other ways to energize their new population. Well, after 20 years of this, two decades of it, we were convinced. A lot of people still had questions, but we were convinced. The Brits had done most of the science on this. And they had talked to their policymakers, and they had determined that around the island of Great Britain, there was a lot of energy to be collected in the waters of Great Britain. Five times more collectible, that word collectible is very important, five times more collectible energy in the waters of the, around the island of Great Britain than they were using each year by burning fossil fuel and making electricity on the island. So they paid a lot of people, they put given a lot of grants out to try to stimulate everything that they could do. They were very, very keen to find devices that would collect that energy. So Joe Cannon, my buddy from a long time ago, Air Force days, we got on an airplane, we went over there, and we went around to see these people. We were going to pick a winner and try to help them. You know, we are going to move from alerting the world to solutions. Well, there we were. We went all over that island. We met back at Heathrow, and we said, you know, I don't think any of these things are going to work. So it was a failed trip. We went home. But I continue to think about it, and I continue to think about Uncle Ed and that water and 45,000 Tennessee homes being energized by that dam, and there's bound to be a way to collect this energy. I was taking my boys back from the Cape Cod, coming down interstate by Allentown, Pennsylvania, and I looked over there at Dorney Park, and there was a roller coaster going round and round like this had a bunch of people on it a bunch of cars on it and I looked at that thing and I just and I was thinking about how to collect a big swath of energy from a big sweep in the current and I thought I put Learjet wings on those roller coaster cars in my mind and I said aha that's it that's the plan well by now I was a retired Air Force officer reserve very reserved and I went out to Carter Rock, which is right near Washington. It's in West Bethesda, and they've got 3,200 people that work starting with models to learn all the physics and everything required to build, say, the Gerald Ford aircraft carrier, which is 1,060 feet long. They learn all the physics, so no new physics will be required because once you build this sucker, if it doesn't work, what are you going to do? So I thought these would be good people to, to begin with. I walked in, got through the gate. It's a secret base, but I talked my way in. I went and talked to the commander. He was a nice fella. And he introduced me to the chief propulsion engineer in the, in the Navy. He had done about 60% of the tonnage in the Navy fleet. He was a sharp guy. And the commander thought if he knew how to put energy into the water, that maybe he might be able to help me take energy out of the water. So I met with this guy, and we met around the conference table, and I took out my Sharpie pen, and I drew my roller coaster, 
put my Learjet wings on it, and I said, this is my idea. I said, can you help me? He said, yeah, we'll help. I look at it for a while. What do you think? I don't know. Maybe we can. They walked me out to my car. I was surprised. I can still remember standing by the door, and the guy leaned over at me, and he said, we'll do anything we can to help you with this. Well, that's our turbine. That's those Learjet wings on that roller coaster. Got a central magnetic gear that separates the one moving part from the other, and then we have power takeoff from an internal generator. It's very simple design, and looking at it, you say, well, why didn't somebody else think of that? Well, it took me nine years working with them to be able to come up with that. Nine years. And now I think we have the ultimate marine turbine anywhere in the world. And we're about to take it big and put it in tides all around the world and start collecting energy for the human population. Now you ask, why did I tell you a story like this? Why did I tell you a story like this? Because during this time, I've had 14 interns from some of the finest schools in the country. And once I got to know them a little bit, they'd always say, you know, I wish I'd lived during your lifetime rather than during my lifetime. And it was very depressing to me to think that. I said, you know, this is the moment of your life right now. These are the worst of times Granted, but these are also the best times. It's up to you. Remember, President Kennedy got shot. Martin Luther King got shot. Bobby Kennedy got shot. As soon as I got to Washington, he got shot. I had a headache for a week. I love that guy, and he got shot. We had riots. We had tear gas on the mall. We had tanks on the mall. We had terrible times, scary times. We had the Cuban Missile Crisis. We get through these things somehow as a human population on this earth. And each of us just gets one lifespan. As Will Rogers said, we're all just passing through. And the time that we're passing through, we've got to make it the best time of our lives. Okay? Okay.